Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the EDF uh, webinar on uh, on Horizon Europe funding and the award ceremony of the EDF Oracle eScholarship e Accessibility Scholarship. Sorry, I had some some windows popping up. Uh, my name is Alejandro Moledo, and I work as head of policy here in the European Disability Forum. Welcome all. And as always, let's start first with the housekeeping rules. Uh, this meeting is accessible. Therefore, we have uh, live captioning, which you can find by activating the Zoom, the Zoom function of, uh, in the menu below, or by using the external link that we shared on the chat. We also have sign language interpretation, international sign language. And then uh, for the questions and comments, you can use the raise, the raise hand function of Zoom or to uh, place your question in the chat box or by uh, requesting the floor and uh, speaking your question out loud. Um, you can send also technical questions using the, the chat box and our uh, colleague Raquel will help you uh, to sort them out. Uh, sorry, we have this technical problem of sharing the screen. Just uh, give me a second. Okay, no problem. Sorry for that. Because it locked me out from the server. Sorry for that once again. Uh, Magdalena Meher is yeah. uh, going to share the power. Okay, thank you. Okay, Alejandro, you can continue, sorry. No problem. That's technical issues that we all face with the pandemic and all these online meetings and webinars. I was uh, about to explain the, the general rules, which are also very much known by everyone. So to remain muted during the, the meeting while you are not speaking. And then when you're giving the floor, you can activate your webcam and your Microsoft, uh, sorry, your microphone. So when you speak, um, you can use the, the raise hand function, as I mentioned, and then please introduce yourself before uh, speaking. Uh, we should try to speak slowly uh, and respect the time. And uh, after the, the webinar, we will share with you all relevant information, the presentation. And just for you all to know, we are recording this uh, webinar. So um, now that we are uh, done with the housekeeping rules, let's go to the uh, of today's agenda. We will have one hour um, of uh, to give you an overview uh, to the EU funds, to the EU funded projects that will be um, uh, presented by our colleague Magdalena Vertsekas and um, uh, Pilar Orero from University uh, Autonoma de, uh, of Barcelona, who will uh, um, focus her presentation on Horizon uh, Europe, one of the main uh, funding programs, research funding programs of the of the European Union. And then we will have a section for questions and answers. So please take notes and uh, note down all your questions during the presentations. And then after that, at 12, we will start with the EDF Oracle e Accessibility Scholarship. This will be an award ceremony to the student that won uh, this year uh, scholarship. So I will now give the floor to Magdalena Versekas, uh, Funding and Grants Officer at the European Disability Forum. Magdalena, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so my name is Magdalena, and I've been working already for two months in DF, so the position is new. So just very briefly, I would like to tell you what, uh, what I will do, what I'm doing in uh, DDF. So uh, for our members, we'll be now informing more about potential funding opportunities. So you can find already now for last few issues of newsletter information about uh, the uh, opportunities of funding. Uh, we'll try to support more our members in development of the proposals of the projects. We will also invite uh, our members to EDF's projects, the ones that we will be developing as uh, leaders, leading organizations. Um, we are having plans for next year to uh, build some capacity in area of fundraising, uh, project development, but also uh, project implementation. So if you will have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. 
And for organizations which are not EDF members, uh, I'm the contact person. If you would like uh, EDF uh, to be in your consortium, if you would like to join um, your project, so then uh, please contact me. And I have next slide, thank you. Uh, so what I would like to present today very briefly is a general overview of European funding. And I chose the programs, the funding streams, which are relevant uh, for disability sector, so which can be interesting for you as our members. Um, so in general, from this year, there is new EU multiannual financial framework, which will last until 2022. Uh, MF, uh, MFF is uh, the long-term budget of European Union, and it will last until 2027. It's important on many levels because thanks to this uh, budget, we can uh, use the funding to develop the skills of um, to, to for educational activities. We can um, use it to for implementation of uh, UNCRPD. Um, and also we can support countries or members uh, from the more disadvantaged regions. So next slide. So um, the, what this slide I just wanted to, with this slide I just wanted to show you that this uh, MFF is a huge budget. It's uh, billions of euros. And that's why it's so important that organizations representing persons with disabilities are participating in European projects. Um, next slide. And um, the first funding uh, is European Social Fund, which is uh, around 100 billion euros. And it can be used for different activities. So education, training, uh, but more also uh, employment access to quality employment and social inclusion. Uh, my presentation is very short, so I will just uh, present you the funding streams. And then if you find any type of funding more interesting or relevant for your organization, you can check more. The next uh, funding stream is, uh, I think Erasmus Plus. Uh, can I have next slide? Well, Erasmus Plus, which probably most of you know, and it's about, um, education, it's not only for young people, like uh, many persons thinks, it's also for adult education, uh, professional education. And what I like the most is exchange of good practices. So for example, if we see that in some professions, some skills are missing, we can create our own training uh, and et cetera. We can exchange good practices or experiences between organizations and different types of organizations. Uh, so I think this is also very interesting, uh, and that in this uh, in this program, in this MFF, uh, and last program of Erasmus itself, inclusion is one of the main priority. So I think it's also very interesting for for EDF and for our members. Next slide. Uh, another funding opportunity or uh, option possibility is a European Solidarity Corps. Solidarity Corps. Um, this is dedicated only to young people from 18 to 30, and it's concentrated on voluntary activities. Um, so for persons with disabilities, there is additional funding covering additional needs. Uh, then the next, uh, next funding is Digital Europe. And as the, names, uh, the name is uh, indicating, it's about innovation and infrastructure in the digital sector. And as we know now, technology is everywhere and actually it's the base of everything. I think it's also very important. And I think it's a great opportunity that can be used. For us, the areas which are the most interesting are um, artificial intelligence, and the uh, use of digital technologies as well as uh, digital skills. Um, I, I personally believe that we can um, fund our activities also through, through different sectors. That's why I wanted to also present a Creative Europe program, which is covering the culture and, uh, and now the visual sectors. 
and it has uh, three main uh, strengths, which is uh, general uh, culture and creative uh, sectors cooperation and exchange between organizations and artists. The second one is uh, supporting uh, film and audiovisual industries. And the third one is reinforcing collaboration between uh, culture and creative actors. And I think this funding can be used uh, in order to support and develop uh, art and culture related with persons with disabilities. Uh, and then the last one uh, that we concentrate the most today is Horizon Europe, which used to be Horizon 2020, but from this year, it's Horizon Europe. And this is funding research uh, and innovation across to implement change. And it's uh, supporting a lot of innovation and also cooperation between um, research institutions, uh, between universities, but also uh, this cooperation with NGOs. Um, so this is also very, very interesting and very important program. And uh, today, Pilar Orero from uh, Universitat Autonomica de Barcelona will present us more um, the program. And also she will, she will uh, explain or show why is it so important then uh, that organizations of persons with disabilities should participate in Horizon Europe? Maybe not to lead because leading is very difficult, uh, but to be a partner. So Pilar, thank you very much. Pilar, I give you the floor. Um, thank you very much and uh, good morning. Um, okay, um, what I want to go very fast or uh, is to present uh, the your funding opportunities that Madalena, in fact, has presented. Why uh, the participation of people with disabilities, uh, the participation of DPOs and the role of the DPOs in the projects, um, and then perhaps uh, more uh, about... Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, and then uh, how to do ideas. Next, next slide, please. Hello, yes. So the thing is that we all have um, great ideas, uh, but the problem is uh, to choose the idea that they would, that people would pay for it. So um, that is the big issue. Uh, and that is where most people fail or most uh, I, most uh, organizations fail. Because yes, I had this great idea, but uh, nobody would pay for it. So the first question to me is always that, would I pay myself for this idea? Uh, and if the answer is no, then I don't go on. But let's, let's move on and hope that uh, you do like the idea. Something very important also added to the information that Magdalena gave is that it depends on the type of um, research proposal that you go. It, it depends on the type of um, action that you go. The funding would be 70%, 100%, or it depends. So it would be very, very important before you uh, embark yourself in a proposal is to understand the, the funding. And uh, if you would need to put yourself funding out of your own time or in kind or what, that is very important. And uh, you have a uh, funding, as Magdalena says, from an Erasmus Plus to an innovation action, to research, to coordination. There are many, many different types of um, opportunities. And perhaps you can start small with, uh, with an Erasmus Plus and then grow into bigger and bigger possibilities. The money is uh, huge, but you have to work hard. It's, they're not going to give you the money for nothing. And in fact, in European projects, you do work very hard. But again, is fulfilling and is very interesting. Next slide, please. As Magdalena was saying, this is the Horizon Europe. It's just started in, in uh, now, this year, and it would run for the next uh, seven years. And then we do have different pillars for their core. And is that in each pillar, you would have uh, different clusters of um, type of projects. Um, so you can go from either infrastructures, uh, so that would pay for um, laboratories, 
uh, to um, projects to do something very concrete, for example, to develop a tactile um, um, app or, or a tactile uh, hardware or to uh, very big um, proposals that is just to do with uh, innovation uh, projects that is hard to go. So we basically uh, would follow in pillar one and pillar two, which are the more um, concrete and smaller projects that we can participate. Next slide, please. Um, why are, is increasingly important for uh, people with disability to participate in these projects? It is because, um, believe it or not, 20 years ago when I started working on this, all the projects had, n they were not user-centric. Um, they were basically is that you wanted to develop uh, an application, you developed the application, and you never tested the application with the end user. More importantly, they never asked the end user what did they want and what did they expect from the application. Um, in the last five years, there has been a massive shift in the European Union, huge, you wouldn't believe it. And now everything starts from the end user. What does the end user want? What does the end user expect? What does the end user think? Um, what are the requirements by the end user? And this is why we do need the end user here in all the projects to tell us what do you need, what do you expect? So basically there are two um, important words that have happened in the last five years in European Union projects. One is that they are user-centric and two is that they co-creation. So they expect the user not only to say what they want, but they also want the user to work with the engineers towards the creation of a better product. And that's what we are at the moment. Next slide. Why projects want people with disabilities? Well, for many reasons. First of all, because of demographics. Um, the European Union also want uh, in their demographics to have children, to have women, to have people with disabilities. And that's very important because it is, um, you know, for, for all the concept of uh, inclusive and the concept of diverse uh, research. And also we need people with disabilities because of the skills that people with disabilities bring into um, the proposal. Why projects want, um, are prepared or they would like people with disability, organizations with people with disabilities. And it is often, it's a bit cynical, but it's true. They want to have the social rep responsibility side of their, of their corporation fulfilled. So we find very often that a company, big company, would employ uh, people with disabilities because then they would, uh, they would um, report that they've been working for three years or two years with this organization, which is people with disabilities, and that would cover their social responsibility or they would cover some of their social responsibility that they have engaged. Often as well, they want to employ people with disabilities in their project or in their companies because they comply with the legislation. So those are the two main reasons why they want. Sometimes it's very nice because they really want to work with people with disabilities and they don't think that working with people with disabilities is uh, very is going to be cumbersome. So uh, let's not be very cynical. Sometimes it's true and increasingly so it is true that they want to work with people with disabilities because they want their input. Next slide, please. Now, that's why they wanted to work with people with disabilities, but why do I think that people with disabilities and DPOs should participate? That's the other way around. Well, because for years we've had uh, the, the, the motto of nothing about us without us. So if we insist that uh, they have to take us into consideration, then we have to participate in European projects and we have to participate in research. I think also because funding perhaps is becoming in some countries more scarce by the government and it is a, a, a way to get funding for your um, organization. Also because I think it is a political dimension Unless you talk about people with disabilities, unless you really bring that up 
all the time. Nobody would understand that you are there. So you have to make yourself heard. You have to be yourself all the time. You know, how about us? How about us? Everywhere in research, in policies. In, so it is very important that people with disabilities are there across all the projects, across from cyber to artificial intelligence, to eco, to in health, everywhere, people with disabilities have got a position and they should be heard. That's very strong, my, my view. And also because of the dissemination, uh, you have to disseminate the research between your own um, organization. I'll give you an example. Um, I think it's very important that uh, organizations understand what is research. Research that we do, it's not what you buy tomorrow in Amazon. Research would be something very, very, very early on in the, in the development of an idea. For example, it's the idea, and um, you're going to be not happy about this, of avatars for sign language. Um, it is only a matter of time that avatars are very good. And it happened in all walks of uh, industry. It happened in my, my research that was uh, translation. At the beginning, I remember that we said that translation by Google Translate would be rubbish, and it was rubbish, and sometimes it's still rubbish. But more and more, the more that we use it and the more we bring data in it, uh, Google Translate or other translation engines become better and better and better. And this is not going to be different uh, for avatars. It's going to be the same. The quality is a story, uh, but that they would be there is a fact. There are two European projects being funded now for, for the creation of avatars and the translation between sign languages through avatars. This is happening as I am speaking. But then it is the responsibility of the organizations that they work in this um, research to explain their end users that the avatars will never replace the human, that the avatars are there to make sure that the quantity of uh, sign language is adequate because we don't have enough sign language speakers to put all the, all the media that we have at the moment into sign language. So the only way that to have all the media that is created all the time would be like YouTube has done, is to have an automatic uh, avatar to do God knows what will come out from an automatic, yes? Um, but event, it would be getting better and better and better. So the idea here that I wanted to make is that the research that we do, it is not what you buy, it is very early prototyping. And we do need people with disabilities in the development of this early prototyping. Next stage, uh, sorry, next <laughs> slide, please. So what is the role of uh, the DPOs in projects, in European projects? Well, first of all, that you have to tell what are the requirements. This is, uh, for example, something that we did in a project that we've just submitted, that it was to do a braille uh, pad, um, a tablet. Um, one thing is what the engineers thought that we needed in the braille tablet. The thing is that the end users wanted a braille tablet, first of all, uh, for music, to read music scores. Then it was to have Excel, uh, to be able to do Excel. Um, they also wanted to understand how does blind people understand um, abstract concepts within space? This was not coming from engineers. Engineers only wanted to know the number of pins by uh, and the and the the um, the um, the space between uh, the the pins. That was the engineers' uh, most important. Um, requirements and the refreshing of the pins. That was what they wanted more than anything. Then when we asked the end users, the people with disabilities to come in and give us the information, they told us, well, yes, the pins are very important. Yes, the distance is very important. But for us, for example, that if, if, we, if, any, um, if any liquid spills on the tablet, it has to be uh, waterproof because sometimes by mistake we, or, or that the, the touch that we have, it's, it's quite smooth and, and we can really appreciate the pins 
coming up. So there was these uh, requirements that uh, engineers or health or whoever is there developing are not aware of, and we need the end users requirements very much. So you have to be there from moment one, from month one. In fact, you have to be there from when you develop the proposal because you have to tell them, hey, we want a waterproof tablet and that has got a price and that has got a research behind it and that has got to be taken into consideration when we are writing about that. The first, the second phase in all the project is that you would be testing. So, okay, you said that you wanted a waterproof. Uh, then they develop a waterproof and then you test it. And then you would test it that it is, is it waterproof just at the top? Is it waterproof where you plug in? Is it waterproof? So then you test and then you give uh, feedback and you test against the requirements that you said at the beginning. You cannot have way through, say, oh, no, I, it's not waterproof. What I want is to do something else. No, because we, what we asked, it was to be waterproofed, okay? It may be the case that being waterproof then leads you to something else, that it has a good, a good grip. So you grip a very well a waterproof tablet, and that is once the other one. But basically, you always test against the requirements that you said at the beginning. Usually this testing takes place uh, with very few people, like five, 10 people in a control environment. But what the European Union always requests is that we pilot. And piloted means that it is not controlled and it is with a large number of people. So for example, for this is sometimes very important that an, uh, uh, an organization has uh, across Europe some um, contacts so, for example, the idea again with the with the tablet would be that we can pilot this tablet across Europe, um, and we send the tablet to Sweden, to Poland, to Greece, uh, to France, and to uh, Portugal, for example. And then it would be the uh, organization only one who takes care of all this piloting the, the um, infrastructure, it would be given, of, you don't have to pay for the, for the tablets, the tablets would be given to you, everything would be supplied to you, but you are in charge of um, making sure that all these countries that I just mentioned, that I've just forgotten, but uh, Sweden, Poland, uh, Greece, and Portugal, will get the tablets, will do the, sometimes you need to, often you need to translate the instructions, that they sign or the ethics um, that they um, agree and they consent to be taking part in the, so you take care of all the piloting. And this for this also, it is a great uh, help if DPOs, they come in and, and help with that. You can also help in communication, uh, putting it in your web pages in, and you can, in the dissemination, you can, when you, whenever you meet uh, someone in your country or someone in Europe, you tell them about uh, this project. It's fantastic if um, you can write a policy paper perhaps on that. And then is the standardization. And the standardization is something that I, I work a lot and, and we need uh, people with disabilities desperately because we don't have people telling us what we need. Yeah, let's go on to the next slide. The next slide is that when you go into um, a proposal, you would find that uh, there is one person that it does 99% of the work. There is one person who doesn't know what's going on. So you would go to these meetings and there is this person in the meeting that ha hasn't got a clue. And I don't know why they're there, but there's always one. There is always a person that says, yes, yes, I will do that, but it doesn't help. And there is a person always there that uh, they just very interested, then they disappear and they always come back when they tell us how much money we're going to get. I hope you are one of the person that helps because uh, usually in proposals, if you don't help, you get a bad name and then they don't call you again. Um, so the idea is that uh, if you don't understand, you say, what am I supposed to do? I have no experience, you have to help me. But then you keep track, you help, you continue working in the project. And when you don't understand something, you say, I don't understand something. Um, but um, you are there and you are 
uh, supporting and you are giving as much information as possible there. Next slide. So wh what do you need to participate? What you need to participate is something called the PIC number. The PIC number is a number uh, of your organization in Europe. It, take, it will take you about three minutes to generate your PIC number. And if you put in Google how to generate a PIC number, it will tell you and very quickly you go and you have it in all the languages in Europe and it's very easy and you get a six digit number. And without this six digit number, you can always participate as your ID number in um, any European project. Um, the other thing it's quite tricky is the person month. The person month is how much you're going to claim. The person month, it varies from uh, country to country in Europe. For example, in Spain, uh, our people are paid and that I'm talking about not net. I'm talking about how much you get, you cost to your company. In, in Spain, you cost your company from 20 to 40,000 uh, usually, uh, 60,000 if you are well paid. So we expect uh, this type of um, budget to come into, into here. Mm -hmm. So the person month is how much you expect to get money to then fulfill, to say, okay, we will need two people for three years. We will need one person for three years. If you need one person for three years and, and the person earns uh, 60,000, you would have 12 person month and you would have 60,000 per year. If the project is three years, then you multiply by three. So you have 180,000 in total because it's 60, 60 and 60. And you will be working 12 months um, yeah, 36 months. If you need more people, then you add people. But that is the way we put in the person month. And how much budget do you need? Well, I don't know. It depends how much you're going to work. Uh, sometimes the budget is given to you. Sometimes you can ask for the budget. You can always negotiate for sure. Mm -hmm. It is rare that you go for a European project for an age, uh, for a Horizon Europe for less than say 150,000 euro for three years. So you would always, almost always have at least a 36 person month. That is one person month, one, one person through the whole. It doesn't mean that the same person has to be there all the time. One person means that you would have a 12 uh, month, uh, but then this person can become three people. Um, 33, 33, 33. And this person can work one in piloting, the other one in communication, and the other one can work in policy, for example. So it doesn't mean that the same person is there. It means that different profiles can add up to 100% one person. It is absolutely uh, basic that the person that participates or the, the association has a person, and if not, you can uh, employ someone to uh, who speaks very good English and writes very good English because you would need to participate in weekly calls and you would need to write uh, reports. And for that, you need someone. It may be a good idea to invest. Uh, I know it's crazy to invest, but it may be a good idea to invest on someone that you would hire at a very good money, 60,000. And um, uh, then uh, you can uh, justify this person and then this person would bring in more money and we bring, so it would be like a fundraiser who is also participating in European projects. This person will participate in the meetings and this person would have, we develop your own idea, your own agenda and your own objectives. And this person would be in charge of organizing internally with your organization or the other organizations, how you're going to participate. The next slide. Um, so I, I gave you the example of the tactile tablet. I gave you the example of the avatars. Those are examples of accessibility being at the heart of the proposal. We wanted to develop an avatar. We want to develop a tactile tablet. But more and more often, accessibility is no longer the objective of the proposal. Accessibility is a condition. And next slide, for example, um, we have all these uh, projects where in all of these projects, accessibility is not 
the objective. Media first, for example, uh, accessibility is only uh, something that we're going to use to access the uh, a media, the, the idea of um, uh, in the future, in, in fact, it's happening now. More and more often, the end users are not consumers, but are prosumers. Um, this happens in TikTok, it happens in YouTube, it happens that end users, consumers are making the, their own um, media content. This media content has to be accessible. So in this project called Mediaverse, what we are telling um, the engineers is that we do need to make sure that whenever we create any content in TikTok, in YouTube, in whatever, uh, it has to be accessible and how to make it accessible, but not only accessible uh, to make it, but also to consume it. So the media player is also accessible in itself. So you have the media player is the little thing that you have at the bottom to, to play any media that says stop, go. Um, then you activate the subtitles, you activate the audio description, you activate the sign language. This is the, the media player. So to develop an accessible media player, it's also very important. Um, another example is, for example, uh, a project called Scent. In Scent, the idea is that we create a, a framework for education uh, on uh, the green Europe for the future. And for us, any anything that uh, is for the future of education in Europe has to take into consideration the needs of people with disabilities. So a small part of Green Scent, which is to do with green Europe, would be that information is available for people with disabilities and people with disabilities can access information. So it's a bi-directional uh, communication there. Uh, traction, for example, we used um, accessibility uh, to reach um, migrants and people in jail. Uh, we used in so close is to do with refugees. So accessibility is no longer uh, the realm of people with disabilities. It's also to do with um, uh, refugees who happen to be also people with disabilities. So uh, we are ex expanding both the scope of accessibility, media accessibility, and the scope of uh, the um, end user, people with disabilities, is people with disabilities and uh, people who have cognitive disabilities, learning disabilities, social disabilities, all this is expanding and they have um, the chance of participating in any project, any European project. From cybersecurity, today is the last day of the proposal for a call on cybersecurity. I am going in that call. Why? Because um, the people who get conned more in Europe to do with cybersecurity is people with disabilities and the aged. And for that reason, it would be crazy. It's a proposal with um, 32 partners uh, and we're going to generate cyber attacks in, the, in two countries in Europe in transport. But uh, in transport, people with disabilities travel. So we would need to make sure that people with disabilities who travel get the information and they are savvy about getting cyber attacks. So that's why I, we, you can go from cyber to health, to green, to anything, to it, the, the scope is there for people with disabilities to participate everything, everywhere. And uh, I think that's the last slide of my presentation. Uh, I will be, I, I am not going to go into developing the idea. I think perhaps it would be better uh, because it's too much information. If we leave it here and uh, in the future, the, these slides would be there for you. Um, and perhaps uh, Magdalena can organize uh, another webinar where we can then go into really developing uh, an idea, how you develop idea, how you apply. But I think I prepare the information in case that I was sh sh too short of time, but I think it's enough now. Madalena, I don't know if you're happy with this. And then we develop ideas and all that for the future. Yes, it's great. Thank you, Pilar. Thanks a lot, Pilar. It was great. 
Um, I see that we we have a question in the chat. I also noted some some question that I would like to to make you um, as well if possible. But the question from from the participant is like, which are the main criteria usually used for evaluators of proposed uh, projects, and which should be considered and emphasized uh, during the the writing uh, of the proposal. Uh well, it depends on what is the objective that you're going for. Um, it doesn't matter, Matthias. Uh, if you're going to go for, okay, if it's going to be for evalu for accessibility, then uh, that you have the end user who's going to be using whatever you're developing. It would be mm -hmm. crazy to get a, a, to develop a, a tactile tablet and get deaf people to develop a tactile tablet. Um, so you have to make understand what is the 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 objective and then understand who would be the best users who would match the objective. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, please feel free to uh, to keep on dropping questions. We still have uh, some time uh, around. Um, Alejandro, we, we have Raquel. two people who ask for the floor. So uh -huh. maybe, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, it's okay. Let's go so for Horacio, Horacio, if yes. you want to take the floor. Yes, thank hello. You. So thank you very much for the uh, seminar. Very interesting. Um, um, and uh, I find um, in the uh, Horizon uh, Europe um, um, framework or um, the call for proposals extremely difficult to find uh, calls that address specifically uh, accessibility and inclusion. So it's extremely difficult to find any particular calls for that. Uh, so um, I, uh, I would like to thank Pilar because she uh, mentioned that uh, these each these topics could be included in several different proposals or calls uh, because it's uh, kind of uh, transversal to many uh, to many of the of the calls in the European uh, in uh, the current uh, price on Europe. Uh, but um, uh, given the fact that there are several projects um, where accessibility is included, I would like to know um, uh, the uh, amount of uh, accessibility or inclusion that these projects should have or, um, or the current projects have. Uh, is there any indication of that? Um, Horacio, I think... Um... In the cluster two, in the projects we are to do with uh, the digital whatever, in almost 50%, the word accessibility is there. We've managed to put the word accessibility almost everywhere. It's amazing. And they, they know that. They know that because the, the European Accessibility Act is coming up. Uh, so in fact, in, all, in most of the XR, the extended reality, uh, calls, they have the word accessibility. Uh, in the artificial intelligence, the word accessibility is there also for desegregated data. I mean, people with disabilities must go to all the artificial intelligence calls for the desegregated data um, input. Um, that's, so more and more often you would find that in the calls, you do have the word accessibility or, um, or they say for all or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And the other thing is that um, how much accessibility should be in a project? Well, first of all, the dissemination should be accessible. That's the basic, the very basic. And if, then, if you can make engineers understand that the, uh, the, their web page has to be accessible, I think we've conquered a lot. But you work on, um, on, the, on the amazing thing of making um, language easier to understand and easier. So I think you have a great uh, future in these calls coming up because you, you can always put the layer uh, of uh, reducing the cognitive load of, of um, information. And I think there are many, many calls. I mean, I would love to work with you in many, many calls because I think what you do and what you've developed is like a massive asset for a lot of calls. For example, the ones on democracy, there are these calls on democracy to make democracy easier. And that is the word accessibility is there and the word uh, people, uh, vulnerable groups is there. 
Um, on artificial intelligence, there is one also to make um, easier information. Again, I think what you've developed fits there very well. So I think you're going to be very busy. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it, uh, and I am uh, very before. happy to work with you if you think, but I think I'm very small compared to you. I don't think so. In any case, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to find the keywords in the titles, for example, they are not explicit. Uh, we have to dig uh, into the, the whole program to, to find maybe. So thank you very much, Pilar. Uh, I will... all, the, all the heritage, Orafi, all the heritage, yeah. you can apply to all the heritage projects, mm -hmm. all of them. Great. For example. Thank you. thank you, Pilar. Thank you very much. We see the results of so many uh, advocacy for mainstreaming uh, accessibility in the research agenda. That's uh, that's really good. Um, I think I, I, I think the next is Roman. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you, Pilar, for your presentation. Can you all hear me properly? Yes. Great. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation because I think it uh, it covered a lot of of reasons why EBU has been involved increasingly in, in Horizon 2020, before Horizon, before FP7 projects. Uh, I, 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 I would just like to add a few ones, a few reasons, additional reasons. Uh, we think uh, being members of consortia, research consortia is always a very good opportunity to even internally raise awareness on, in our case, visual impairment and accessibility. It's also the opportunity to witness, to witness the latest developments in specific fields. Recently, it, we, we are currently involved in, in a, a research project on connected and autonomous vehicles, for instance, because we, we are sure that it's uh, very important for the future uh, transportation and independent mobility of uh, visually impaired persons. Uh, these research projects are also uh, a great opportunity to, opportunity to involve our members directly, especially with the testing phase and the need assessment phases that were evoked before. Uh, it's also a possibility to reward them, I mean our members financially, uh, and to, re to reward their expertise of this, and to mobilize our volunteer uh, experts on specific uh, issues. But I would like also to draw the audience's attention on a few drawbacks, a few things uh, we might all have as DPOs to be uh, uh, careful about. Um, by experience, we know that there is a tendency by uh, consortium members and in particular industrial partners to endorse results on behalf of the of the end user organization, and they would say easily, "Oh, by the way, this result has been uh, approved." by, in our case, the European Blind Union, which is not the case. That's one thing. So we, every time we, made, we make it clear, we will not endorse any result. Uh, the second thing, still in terms of endorsement, is uh, related to accessibility. Uh, in the, this project I was mentioning, at the very beginning of the project, we made clear that we would like uh, the, 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 the reports to be accessible to visually impaired persons. So we sent, we circulated guidelines, etc. And the consortium is paying attention to this, uh, to a point that at the beginning of, of every report on the, on the first page, it is written that this report complies with the accessibility guidelines of the European Blind Union. But it is tricky because it means that in my case, I, on behalf of EBU, would have to check every report of the consortium when they are delivered to make to, to be sure they are accessible, which of course is impossible in terms of, of time. So you have to be careful with this as well. I also noticed in the past that there is a, a clear lag between for these research projects when compared to other Erasmus Plus or Serve. Uh, X-REC projects, there is a lag between the data collection, step one, and uh, the publication of results. And most of the time we mobilize not only our national members, but also the individual membership of our national members. And they want results, and they want to read the results, and they want to know more on why uh, they were gather gathered maybe seven or eight months ago in a room and expressed needs and why 10 months later, there is still not a report on this. And 
in addition to this, why isn't there an accessible version of the report <laughs> of the focus group, for instance? So we have to be careful about this. Uh, to just bounce on what was said before by the previous participant, at this stage, we are lucky. We don't have to go and ask and check what are the current calls. We are solicited, we are contacted by companies, in particular previous uh, companies, organizations or universities, uh, which apparently enjoyed our collaboration. But uh, what we do, we, we cannot accept everything because we, are, uh, we have small resources, limited resources. We tend to, first of all, to favor um, organizations and future consortia which contact us way ahead of the application deadline. And uh, this most of the time is a real proof of professionalism. We realize that in the future, well, when the, well later when the, the, the projects are implemented, then the quality of the project is better, of course, than for projects when we got contacted at the very last moment. Most of the time to sign a, a letter of support. So these were a, a few uh, pieces of advice that uh, were gained by experience uh, from BU. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Roman. That's uh, really useful. I think we, we've all been in, in, in similar situations uh, and hope it, they improve. Um, Andreas, uh, I think you're next. next. Yes, hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, both Pilar and now Roman for the uh, added comments. Uh, I am representing a small uh, social enterprise uh, from Greece, which uh, we are uh, target. All our uh, activities and projects are targeting towards accessibility, and we are speci specified in the intellectual accessibility uh, part. So that is why uh, I, I thought that Horacio also mentioned. So uh, my question is, is this, uh, for example, uh, as you, I don't know if you know, but I will let you know that Greece is a country that does not fund uh, nationally uh, very easily uh, projects of our field, the field of intellectual disability. So we are our main sustainability uh, program for uh, enterprises like us is uh, European fundings and European projects. And uh, the main problem that we are facing is that we may have a great idea that can be transparent, but the problem is how to sustain it. For example, we have been funded, we're trying to create a European platform for um, information uh, that all the articles are going to be written in an easy to read, uh, format and uh, we would like this to expand into creating a, a complete media package for all uh, for the field of um, disability in whole so um, my question is that we have an idea we have a small funded idea because it has been funded by an Erasmus plus program which you know the budget shilling is very low and we can do very little things budget wise and we mostly volunteer than ourselves and our time and our manpower in order to keep it alive could could this be refunded if we try to present a, such an expanded model on the horizon uh, on the horizon platform or does our idea has to be a hundred percent innovative I oh, Pilar, Magdalena, yeah. The question is for me. Um, okay, first of all, um, Europe will not fund any platforms. Why? Because platforms are very costly to not to build. Technology is quite easy. The difficulty with it is to get enough people to be interested in coming to your platform and for the sustainability of your platform in the future. So Europe less and less and less would fund for a platform and more and more would ask you to think how can you integrate yourself in an existing platform. So your idea is perfect, but you have to think in some other platform like EDF. EDF is a great platform. 
Would EDF, you're gonna hate me, Alejandro. I don't know if it's a good idea, but EDF has got a great platform because it's got sustainability and it's got it's got uh, and it's got many DPOs already uh, in it. So it would be to ask EDF to add this that you want to add into the EDF, not to generate and and uh, suddenly uh, uh, and yet another platform. That's one thing. And, and the second thing is that an Erasmus Plus, to move from an Erasmus Plus to a Horizon 20, uh, for, to a Horizon Europe, it doesn't work. Nothing is the same. It's not person, you haven't got person month, you haven't got work packages, you haven't got, you have intellectual output, the money is rubbish, the dedication is huge, basically it's paperwork and it just get, takes you nowhere. So it is a completely different concept, an Erasmus Plus from a Horizon Europe. Though, again, like I said to Horacio, uh, the idea of easy to read is so powerful, is so big, is so massive that you have a great future as not as the objective of the research, not as the objective of the platform, but as a, a tool to any other. So you can you can plug the idea in health, in cybersecurity, in, in nanotechnology, in anything because nobody understands what we write. So please, please keep on going. But to me, I wouldn't do it. I would do it like that as an as a comp, as a service. I don't know if I reply to your question. I hope I did. No, no, it's it's uh, all, all comments you know are, are positive for me. I, I I I will take note of that. So thank you so much. Loud and clear. Thanks a lot, Pilar. Um, Okay, I think we are reaching the end of this uh, webinar. We still have a couple of minutes, but I would like to to make um, um, a question to my colleague uh, Magdalena because uh, we DPO we all we sometimes uh, we're contacted by by um, academia or by companies that want to put forward a, a project proposal. So, uh, in in your view, Magdalena, what are the questions that a DPO uh, should ask? to evaluate whether a proposal is good or not? What would be the strategic thinking? Yeah, well, first you have to, we have to, uh, if you are approached by a consortium leader, by the organization just writing application, you, you should first check what are exactly the activities of the project. Uh, then second question is what are the activities for my organization and the third thing which is should be immediately following the second one is like what is the budget for these activities because the fact that we are NGOs doesn't mean that we can do things for free so the budget is very important and um, then you can ask also about the consortium who are the partners so maybe you know some or maybe you know that with some you don't want to work this is also important you can ask what well, i always ask uh, after first contact i asked i ask about concept note because then when you receive a concept note from the uh, project leader you can know more um, about the project we ask of course about the deadline but usually the when we are contacted the deadline is announced um, the size of the project and the length uh, of the project. Um, and I think that it's, um, and uh, yeah, and I think that also very important thing is what, that we define at the beginning of the conversation, the role of your organization, of our organization in the project. Um, if like uh, somebody mentioned, if it's advisory board only, or we are like project partner, and then depending your internal organizational situation, your, your financial capacity, um, your HR situation, you decide if it's better for you at the moment to join as a full partner or just to be advisory board. But what I want to just emphasize maybe in the end of this part of the webinar is that no matter if we participate as advisory board members or full-time, full, full, full partners, we should participate because it's really important to to be involved and to to influence all these projects. Of course, if we are project partners, we have bigger influence because we participate in all the meetings, we participate in creation of the deliverables in all the processes. Hmm. So, um, so anyway, if uh, any of members would have any questions, I'm here. Please contact me, and we can support you in um, in your hmm. fundraising processes. 
Thank you. Exactly. Thanks a lot, uh, Magdalena. I see, uh, I think we are over time for one minute, but I see a very concrete question on the chat. Are there any possibilities to see the overall success rate for the specific call, for example, in uh, which call more projects will be funded? No. No, right? No. It's okay. Yeah, okay. No, but you can evaluate it a bit because if you know that there is a budget of, for example, 15 million and you know that more or less maximum size of the project is, for example, 3 million, then you know that there will be no more than five. Hmm. So you can more or less evaluate how yes. many mm -hmm. in some cases, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Well, um, thanks a lot, Pilar and Magdalena, for uh, your great presentations. I we hope we this was useful for all of you, and more and more um, we see um, representative organizations of persons with disabilities contributed uh, meaningfully to to research. If there is any additional questions, uh, feel free to send it to to us, and we will reply by by email. So now we move to the award ceremony of uh, our scholarship in partnership with uh, Oracle, the EDF Oracle eAccessibility Scholarship.